Hi, my name is Hannah Crawford and my pronouns are she, her. Hi there, my name is Simi J. Patoka and my pronouns are they, them. And we are... The Dreaming Divas! We are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform, but from the perspective of young singers. And today we had the pleasure of chatting with mezzo-soprano Kimberly Barber, a voice professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, associate dean external for the faculty of music, coordinator of Opera Laurier, and an esteemed performer. We were so excited to have her on. We had some great conversations about body mapping, trouser rolls, and role preparation. Uh, but before we get into that, we would like to acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendaki, Nyon, Winsio, and neutral people. We seek re-indigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land and we honor these communities as traditional stewards of these lands. We hope you enjoy the interview and check it out. Ding! Aki means land in Anishinaabe. And at Wilfrid Laurier University where I work, we espouse a shared vision and pathway to improve our relationship with the land and the people with whom we share it. As such, it is important to further our understanding of the long-standing history that has brought Laurier to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Thus, I acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses, as well as the lands in Kitchener, where I live, are located on the Haldeman Tract, traditional territory of the neutral or Attawandaran Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples and symbolizes the agreement to share, protect our resources, and not to engage in conflict. From the Haldeman Treaty of October 25th, 1784, this territory is described as being six miles deep from each side of the Grand River beginning at Lake Erie and extending in the proportion to the head of said river, which them and their posterity are to enjoy forever. The treaty was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations after the American Revolution, and despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory after losing much of it to settlement of newcomers. As we acknowledge and absorb this fact, it's vital that we recognize our own privilege as residents on this territory and the harms this settlement have caused to the original stewards of this land. The 94 calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission compel us to sit with these truths and to do better. As an educator and an artist, I feel my obligation to feel the discomfort around these truths and to grow in understanding and awareness of Indigenous teachings and ways of knowing as best I can. This practice is ongoing, the learning is endless and the lessons are deep and sometimes painful. And this, my friends, is life. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, learn, and work. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and water in which Laurier and the city of Kitchener is now present. As artists, we have much to learn from Indigenous people and their teachings. It is part of our sacred trust as part of the human family to share our art wholeheartedly, to tell our stories from as many perspectives as possible, and to be willing to stand back when necessary and amplify the voices and stories of others. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Great to be here. Um, like I said, we'll start off with a 60 second life story. I'm just going to hold up my handy dandy timer right over here. And, Sweet. uh, Whenever you're I ready. I can't see it though. Can't see oh. it. It'll, it'll, it'll. Oh, be I see. Okay. Yes. Okay. It'll start counting down when you hit it. Right. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Go right. Ahead. Go. I was born in Guelph to my parents who were studying at the University of Guelph at the time. And I moved to Toronto when I was just a baby. And I grew up mostly in Toronto with a brief sojourn in France when my dad had a sabbatical. Um, a fun fact was that my parents actually ran a free school in Toronto, which is where I went for two years 
in the inner city in Toronto. And I had a fantastic choir teacher in my middle school. And that was when my love of music really started, uh, other than being on my dad's lap and listening to symphonies when I was a kid. Um, favorite games growing up were dress up and school. Funny how that, that translated into real life. I uh, had a great high school music teacher who encouraged me with a scholarship to be a choral scholar because I didn't even know you could take voice lessons. So that's how I got my first voice lessons, saw my first opera when I was 17. And is that it? That's it. <laughs> oh my God, you're kidding me. That's okay. Wow. Just keep going. Why not? Keep going. Yeah. Then I uh, studied at, at University of Toronto, did a stint in the Canadian Opera Company Ensemble, went on a Canada Council grant to Europe in 1988, got a job at the Frankfurt Opera, sang there for five years, went freelance after that, uh, did a bunch of great gigs, and then came back to Canada in 2001, ostensibly just for a year, and got the job at Laurier in 2002, and I've been teaching ever since. I know you and I have chatted a little bit about this in the past because obviously I went to Laurier with you. Um, you do you focus a lot on Alexander technique and body mapping specifically. Right. Um, I personally, I don't think I've ever done any body mapping with you. I didn't. I've never had the pleasure. I know. Isn't that sad? It is. But sad. there's no time like the present. Exactly. I always had. Well, I was an athlete in high school. And I think I always intuitively felt like singing was a full body activity. At least that's how I always experienced it. And I guess I had my first Alexander Technique sessions probably when I was at U of T and certainly when I was at Banff uh, and many other summer programs that I did. And it always really resonated with me. So, you know, to, to be exploring alignment and my, my body in the physical space was something that um, just seemed really inherent to my practice. And, um, and I think it, I, I intuited it that it was important in my teaching, but I had no evidence for that other than that that was just sort of what I had always done. And then you'll know, Hannah, that there's a, a massage and chiropractic clinic in Waterloo called Guidonian Clinic, and they do a lot of training for musicians in all kinds of areas and one time there was a poster up there saying they were doing a a course they were offering a course a full one day course called what every musician needs to know about the body and i thought hmm, that sounds really cool that sounds like something i'd be into and so i went and did this workshop and which was a body map mapping workshop and it just completely blew my mind largely because I thought, oh my gosh, like this thing that I always thought was just sort of a weird thing that I do is actually a system of learning. And of course, there was far, 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 far more to learn than, than I knew myself. But um, in any event, I went and spoke with the clinician and said, I really want to learn how to do this. And so I guess the the basis for it really is that we build a foundation, a firm foundation of bodily understanding or somatic understanding. So the way that the body functions, the way it moves, we give ourselves a grounding in that and then we build musical technique on top of it. So it's not a technique in and of itself. Um, it's really embodying understanding and embodying our music making. So in essence, you build your musical technique on top of that with that understanding all the time. So you're always coming back to the body and in particular to your own experience of your body. And you're always testing it basically against reality. So um, every kind of instruction that I get if I attend someone's master class or I, I hear a student, I'll ask a student to tell me what it is that they're experiencing or what their understanding is of the breath or the tone or whatever. I'll always be investigating, is this based on physical reality 
or is this just a, an intellectual concept, a metaphor, uh, a symbol that has no connection to how the body actually functions and how it's structured? Because we do work a lot, especially in singing, I think in music in general, but in singing particularly because so much of the instrument is hidden, it's inside. And so we work a lot with metaphor and imagery and, and, and all of that can be fantastic. But sometimes we'll have an image or a concept that is disconnected from the actual reality and then that can create tension or um, it can cause us to get all tangled up and, uh, and potentially to work at cross purposes to how our body should be working. And so the body mapping just helps us to train in a better way and to be really aware of what we're doing physically when we're doing it. Um, and, and the exciting thing about body mapping is that it's not specifically for singers, it's for all musicians. And so I can teach a pianist as easily as I can teach a trumpeter or a, an oboist or a percussionist. And in fact, I really love working with instrumentalists because I don't have a preconceived notion of what their technical requirements are supposed to be. I just watch their bodies in motion and I inquire of them what they're experiencing. And then through that, I can give them information or, you know, and so Hannah, you'll know that I have lots of um, anatomical models and I use diagrams and, uh, but a lot of it also is just your, your own personal awareness of, of your body and how it works. So we work a lot with, with touching and, and feeling, okay, this is, this is where, this is my collarbone. These are my ribs. Oh, where are they? And, oh, there, there are my intercostal muscles, you know, oh, yeah. my diaphragm is up under here. Really? Um, and, uh, and so, and every student's a little bit different because some really like to just experience it within themselves and become really aware of their movement just by the movement happening and by them perhaps holding their hands on themselves or watching me do something with my hands on myself so that they can see me breathing, um, for example. But others really love to see pictures or they, they love to interact with my, you know, I've got a spinal model, I've got an arm model. Um, I, I really covet a skeleton, but they're very, very expensive. Um, but $1,700 for a skeleton. So I haven't, I haven't invested in that. Um, but everyone's got their own uh, way that works best for them. And so I also try to tease out what, what's the way that's going to work best for the individual student and what, what's going to be the thing that's going to really help it click for them. If it's all right, I'd like to completely pivot <laughs> um, and talk pivot. about- It's our middle word, it's our middle name these days, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> pivot, um, that was a friend's reference. <laughs> Uh, I would love to talk about your blog. Um, it's yeah. so interesting and exciting to, I, I didn't get to read the whole thing because it's been going on for um, some time now, but um, recently being introduced to it, I, I tried to read several passages and it's really interesting how um, I've read blogs that singers create and it's all about singing and you talk about life through the lens of a singer, which is really mm -hmm. interesting to me. How did that get started for you? Uh, it happened... What, well, it was when I was redoing my website and uh, I, I did a complete website revamp in 2019. And my web designer said to me, you know, have you ever thought about doing a blog? Like, you know, you, because we were talking about, you know, how you can get more eyes on your website if you're, you know, you're connected to Instagram and Twitter, blah, blah, blah. And I sort of care about that and I sort of don't care about it at all. And, um, but anyway, she, she put the bug in my ear of, uh, maybe blogging and I really like to write. I'm a journaler. I've always been a journaler for my whole life really. And, um, what I had noticed was a lot of the things that I kept reflecting on were, and, and I, I have to say, my students really are incredible inspiration for the blog. If you, if you read it regularly, you'll, you'll see I, I'll often reference stuff that happens 
in the lesson, in my group class, in, in uh, you know, some kind of something or other in opera class that happens. And I really started to notice this interconnectivity between singing and identity. And so as you put it, singing and life. And uh, for me, singing really is a, is a metaphor for life. Uh, it's just so often that because voice and identity are really inextricably connected. And really profound shifts can happen in us when we sing and when we study singing, as I'm sure, you know, you're both nodding, um, there'll be, oh, and life events can really affect how our voice functions too. So it's that, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two way street there. Um, we really, you know, of course, as singers, we really identify with our sound and, um, you know, even our vocal range, it, it gives us sort of a sense of, of who we are. But just as human beings, you know, on a general level, we have a really strong identification with our, uh, the timbre of our voice, with the, the tempo of our speech. When we people can tell by the quality of our voice, whether we're happy or sad. Um, <clears throat> I remember when I was first studying voice at university and my teacher used to you know i'd come in for my lesson and she would know instantly the second i walked in the second i said something she'd say what's wrong and i think how does she know that i think we're really good at that <laughs> yeah but but i think we start to get really attuned to um to the pitch to the flow of the breath to the, the quality of the sound. I mean, of course, we're picking up on other cues as well. But I guess that's that's where it came from, Simi, if you, you know, in a nutshell, I just, I started to think, I have a lot of thoughts about this, about, um, and and also about singing and the role that singing played in my, has played and continues to play in my own life and in my own um, development as a human being, my growth as a human being. And I just became really interested in that. And I thought, I, I just want to blog about it. And um, so from the beginning, like when I first started that first summer, my website wasn't going to be ready to go live. So I, I happened to be in in Lyon at the time because I, I, I teach there many summers, uh, not since COVID, of course. But um, so I would be in my hotel room and I would, I, wrote all kinds of blog posts like I thought ha, I'm gonna get way ahead of this and I'm gonna like you know get four or five of them ready and then I'll just always do that and then I'll just have one ready ha never happened but <laughs> uh, that was the last time that ever happened um, but as it as it turns out it, it becomes a very interesting thing like already today I've been thinking about what am I gonna what am I gonna write about this week and often there'll be something that'll that'll happen um either to me personally or something a student says, or maybe something that comes up in this conversation or it's something I read in the paper. And then I, I just start to riff on that and think about how does that relate to me as a singer? How did it maybe relate to my students? Maybe it's something that I saw and felt and then I say it to a student in a lesson and boom, the light goes on for them, um, whatever it is. So that's how I, that's how I started it. That's amazing. And I'm just, I'm curious to know what, for, for the readers, what do you hope they take away from the blog? I guess the, the big thing is that um, we're all on this amazing journey mm -hmm. together. And, uh, and the voice is just a kind of a conduit. It's a, it's a, it's a portal. It's a way uh, towards self-discovery. And what, what I, what always is really heartening to me is I'll, I'll get, people will email me, email me and say, sometimes it'll be just, you know, two lines and I'll just say, thank you so much for your post this week. I was really feeling, uh, desperate and something you said just really, I, I, I it gave me courage again, or, um, or they just go word, 
<laughs> you know, uh, or um, they'll just say, oh, it, it really made me grateful because I realized I'm not alone. Because that's something, and I think that's maybe a bit why the two of you are doing what you're doing is, uh, you know, when I was in school, we never talked about what was hard. And even in my professional life, you, you did not, it was shameful. You don't, you don't talk about that. Of course, you're not struggling. No one's struggling. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you were hiding it all the time. And I think that takes a, a terrible toll. And it makes us feel really apart from one another. And we're not apart from one another. We're actually really, really connected. And we, we share the same fears and the same concerns and joys and not all at the same time, obviously, but it's very helpful if we, uh, I, I, I just really try to tell the truth and not sugarcoat it. And um, Yeah. It's interesting you should say that because I remember I had the privilege of working with Scott Perry this summer mm. and he, he said something very similar to what you said is it journaling and talking, talking about how you felt in the industry wasn't something that was very commonly done. And now it's becoming more and more, more and more acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking, I had a one-on-one -on -one session with him and I said, you know, the, the introspectiveness of it terrifies me to actually like write down how exactly I'm feeling about mm -hmm. singing and how my life is impacted by singing. The mm -hmm. thought is terrifying because it, it does feel kind of shameful in a way. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think it's really inspiring to have someone like you who's had this huge, amazing career and working at Laurier in a very esteemed profession saying, yeah, sometimes it, it sucks. Sometimes it's great. So mm -hmm. it's, it's actually really inspiring to hear it. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. That's, that's the point. I just really hope that people take away that, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't matter how big of a career you have or how, how quote unquote successful you've been. Um, Everyone struggles. I, I've, I've stood on the same stage with some really, really big artists and they all struggle. But I think it's also really beautiful to have a community in which we can talk about these things. Like I know, and Hannah and I have talked about this extensively many times, um, <laughs> that we're very grateful that we were able to come into each other's lives and talk about what's challenging for us. And um, we've partner practiced before and things like that. And we know what the other is struggling with. And like, I felt, I hope that the feeling is mutual, but I always feel really supported in working on what I find challenging and then also enjoying what I am successful at with Hannah being there as support for that. Yeah, for sure. I think the community, there were several posts that I've done on that topic. Uh, and that, that was something that I, in, in the pandemic that I think was, uh, something we really, really missed a lot. And I discovered community through a meditation group that I, that I joined online. And they, they talk a lot in meditation circles about the power of community. And so, you know, it, we, we often think, oh, well, you know, meditation is a contemplative practice as you, you do it by yourself. But in fact, uh, in, in Sanskrit, the word is Sangha, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, but that means community. And you create a community of a practice. And it's the feeling. And our, our teacher online will often say when he's uh, doing his direction for us in the meditation, he'll often remind us, think of the others who are in this with you. So even though you can't see them, even though you can't feel them, you can, you're breathing together. You're all doing this practice together. And uh, I think partner practice is a huge thing. So important. I really push all my students to do it. Um, and it's, it's becoming a little more endemic at Laurier, which is, is wonderful. Uh, more and more of us are teaching group technique classes, which I think are hugely important more even than the, uh, you know, some what we all know as, as studio class, performance class, master class, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
because the the playing field really is even for everybody and uh and there's just such a sense of everyone just kind of mucking in together and uh and sometimes you know the first year student can do something really spectacular in that setting that they normally would feel like oh you know i can't i can't show up really because there are all these fourth years and opera diplomas and uh, what do I know? And then those students are really blown away by something that that person can bring to that setting and, and vice versa. And so it it's really gives us that sense of a non-hierarchical learning situation, uh, which I think is so important. I was wondering if we could do uh, another pivot. This is a topic that I am particularly interested in, even though there's not a lot of trouser rolls out there for sopranos, but trouser rolls. This is mm. something you you are you have extensive knowledge on. I was wondering yeah. if you could talk about how you prepare yourself for trouser rolls since the physicality may be a little bit different from mm. um, your day-to-day -day life. And uh, how did playing trouser rolls affect how you present yourself or how you carry yourself in your day-to-day -day life, if at all? Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Well, I guess uh, I was training to play trouser roles my whole life because um, I grew up in a family of boys and I was the only girl far and wide for the longest time. I have two brothers. All my cousins were boys. Um, and I played a lot of sports, as I told you. Um, and, um, and, I, and I have like just sort of my, my physiology, like I have a very straight figure. I'm not a curvaceous person um so i was a bit of a tomboy growing up uh that's what we used to call it back then although i did like wearing dresses but i, I was i sort of I, I i was kind of i was a cross dresser i think um and um so i i kind of gravitated naturally toward it i think um and and because of sports I was a jock in high school so I think I had this natural comportment of um you know I never had a girly walk or something like that you know I, I I never was like one of those slinky I remember there was this like super sexy girl when I was in high school who all the guys were in love with she was about six feet tall she became a model and she would kind of sashay down the halls <laughs> and all the the guys would just be like oh wow and i was like yeah like that just could never be me it was just never going to be me um as much as i might want that um and so it wasn't until i became a mezzo which was two years into my university degree and then i sort of discovered trouser rolls and i just i fell into it um and i guess as far as the you know, I, I, I always made an effort to be as um, comfortable in my physiology as I could be and really tried to, I really tried to embody male identity. I, I don't, I don't even know how else to say that. Um, and I think it, it was just really helped by, I had so many models in my life and I, I just spent all that time around boys and, um, and I've always felt very comfortable with men. Um, uh, like when, when I would do Figaro, I would always go out drinking with the boys. Like I was never hanging out with Susanna and the Countess. I was always hanging out with Basilio and Bartolo and <laughs> the Count and, It was for uh, research purposes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Totally. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of that, like I have comfort around that kind of energy. Um, and I don't feel threatened by it particularly. Um, and, uh, and then I, I just began to really, really enjoy it. I, I liked the freedom that it gave me to to be very physical on stage because often the the female characters have to be more you know comported and yeah um, whereas the the male characters and my, my my probably my very favorite 
character to play was the composer in Ariadne. And mm -hmm. I, I, I performed it a lot. And I, I've just felt really close to that character. Um, and he's very kinetic, you know, he's very mercurial and he's, his moods are always changing and he's super dramatic. And um, I just found him very exciting to play. And then I guess the, and, and then I did a lot of handle and a lot of handle trouser rolls and um, so a lot of kings and noblemen and, um, and Xerxes was really, really fun to play because He's just, he's a spoiled brat of a king who gets whatever he wants. And, and I remember being in the rehearsal process and Stephen Wadsworth, wonderful, wonderful director, uh, said to me, well, he's completely entitled. So, you know, play that. And I said, what, what's that? What's entitled <laughs> mean? What? And he said, oh, like entitled is like, when you don't even have to question your own authority and when you can have whatever you want, you just snap your finger, fingers and things appear. And I said, you're kidding, that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to tell me twice. Um, and it was, it was so liberating. Like I just never played a character in that way before that, and, and we, we had all these jokes in rehearsal um, that uh you know there was a, a a servant person who was um you know my lackey and i had this sedan chair and they carried me on the sedan sedan chair so four men four burly men had to carry me then in the sedan chair and then i had this servant who would who would um come to my beck and call. So we played around with that, but we improvised a little bit and I was constantly like snapping my fingers and he would bring me a cup of tea and, and then I would say, you know, put it there and, oh, it's new, not enough, not enough sugar, three lumps, please. And, um, and it was just so much fun. That's yeah. So cool. And then I, then I, I did uh, a workshop one year for Pacific, no, Vancouver Opera. Um, because they, I was singing with Vancouver Opera and they had a production of Rosen Cavalier coming up and they were getting all kinds of questions because people were kind of freaked out about two women kissing each other on stage, whatever. Uh, yeah, magic. <laughs> and uh, horrifying. And, uh, and so, but they just didn't understand the convention and they, um, they wanted to know why why was the, why were those two parts written for women and then um, and it was really interesting so I, I did this whole workshop for them uh, for continuing education of the opera company about trouser rolls and and the tradition behind it and um, and it was really fun I got great questions from the audience and um, and I'd never really thought much about it before I just I just did it but I, but people said I was very believable. I do think that being said, I think a lot of companies are putting on operas where they're actually changing the narrative a little bit as it like in terms of, we could talk about several different things, but I, I would say mainly in terms of sexism and race, I'm mm -hmm. seeing changes in how, how characters are being perceived by the people behind the desk and then how they are choosing to show that on stage. Sure. And I think that's progress. Yes. <laughs> Well, I was, I was just reading about a production of Ariadne. Now I'm trying to remember where I saw it. Did I read it online? I can't remember. Uh, but uh, where the composer, they, they chose to actually make her a woman. Interesting. And so they said, I, I think it was a review in Opera Canada of a new production. And, um, and they said, yeah. And then there was a real frisson when in the duet with Cervinetta, because normally it's, you think of them, it's being a gender, uh, you know, opposite gender, but then here it is, it's two women. And it, so it's interesting that I was thinking about it. I thought, yes, you know, there's actually nothing in the text that is overtly sexual and there's nothing really that's gendered about it. 
So it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I thought, wow, I would really love the opportunity to, because uh, it was the conductor was saying, you know, here we are in this day and age of where we're talking about, uh, you know, hashtag me too and time's up and, and we're always talking about how women conductors and directors don't have full agency in the business and they're not respected and they don't get the jobs the same way as the men do. And then we have an opportunity to have a woman who is playing the part of a composer and we're saying, oh no, you have to dress up as a man because composers are men. And so they just said, no, we're just gonna flip that narrative and it's sung by a woman, so let her be a woman, a woman composer. Imagine. It that vaguely reminds me of though this was played as a trouser role. Um, oh, was it Boston or Chicago? Um, in Chicago during September, they had a production of Carmen where um, the Don Jose was played by another mezzo, Stephanie Blythe played Don Jose and then yes I heard about that one yeah Jamie, yeah Jamie Barton and oh, I was heartbroken that I couldn't go see it um but I was so interested because they changed the narrative even though um uh uh Stephanie Blythe uh was in her drag persona uh Blythely or Tonio which I think is very clever um uh I still think that that adds something to the story because yeah. well that being said oh sorry I, I'm gonna go on a quick tangent here I think <laughs> in media there's a lot of fear of showing um, that queer relationships can be toxic because they, I th like being a member of the queer community myself, like, no, we don't want to be seen by the straight community as, or a cishead community as toxic people, but anybody can be toxic. Anybody can be, can cause harm. And yeah, it doesn't matter who you are, like what gender you are, sexuality. So I think it's a really interesting thing because I consider that to be one of the most toxic relationships in all of opera um to show <laughs> that it can happen between any two people it doesn't necessarily have to be between yes sure get the ball rolling i digress yep. we, we we went off topic a little bit we really did <laughs> did you want to bring us yeah, back to where we were uh well where were we uh basically we were just talking about uh uh okay. about gender in opera yeah, we stop talking about trouser rolls and um oh i found us oh this is a little bit of a pivot it's mostly a joke but from two sopranos what's it like being a mezzo awesome. <laughs> mezzos are amazing yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting i mean people say oh that's the, the temperament and all that <laughs> Um, I think sopranos, there's just, there, there, there's a, a, often there's quite an edginess of like, just the, because there, there's so many sopranos and there's, there's a lot of competition for the, the parts and stuff. I mean, there are lots of mezzos too, but generally speaking, I feel like mezzos are just a little bit more chill. Yep. Um, you're right. Is there because they're, they're not as much thrust in into the limelight in the same way and it's interesting you know i really also gravitated towards roles where i wouldn't be forced to do that um i only sang the barbara seville once one production seven performances but i and i i, I thought it's my dream role i can't wait to sing it it terrified me that that aria the first aria that's like the, the aria everyone knows. And I remember the conductor would say to me backstage, Kim, just can you say it again and again to yourself. Yo, I am a diva. I am a diva. I am a diva. Go out, do it, go. And I'd be, I'd be standing on stage going, I am a diva, I'm a diva. No, I'm not, I wanna go home. I'm a diva? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's so strange. Um, I really love being in an ensemble of people. I've certainly done starring roles, like no question. I did, I did lots of big roles. Um, but that, that whole, you know, like one person kind of carrying the show, 
that's hard. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like a lot of that repertoire, like the big Italian repertoire, for instance, they're not like Tosca. You don't really have to get a, along with the rest of your cast. It can just be your show yeah. if you want. Right. Um, whereas marriage of Figaro, you cannot do that by yourself. It doesn't matter how fantastic you are. You are not going to pull it off as the countess if you are not having relationships with everybody else in the cast. Exactly. Same with Susanna, same with the count. Even though these are huge roles. Um, so I really did gravitate a lot toward Mozart and Handel probably for that reason and Strauss. Um, but yeah, I think being a mezzo, um, you don't have as much pressure often on yourself. And you can be a team player and you have to know how to blend because you're going to sing a lot in duet, in trio, in ensemble, larger ensemble. I really like doing that. So, um, yeah, I like that about it. Um, I like the pressure of not having to sing super high all the time. Although in my heyday, um, I did have a very reliable high C. Um, in fact, uh, one of my gigs when I was in, uh, at, in Frankfurt was I sang Macbeth. I sang the, um, the, uh, la the, the, the Dama di Lady Macbeth. So it's like the, the little, you know, her, her lady in waiting and Lady Macbeth was played by Rosalind Plowright who, I don't know if you know who she is, but she was a big deal. And she was completely neurotic about her high C. And um, even though she, she was a, like a phenomenal singer, like she really had a tone color like Callas. Mm -hmm. And um, absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous voice, beautiful woman, totally self-deprecating and always nervous. And so there's a big, big ensemble in Macbeth um, end of act two, I think, where, uh, just after the murder, where Lady Macbeth and her lady have to both sing high C. And she always said to me, I'm not going to sing it. It's on you. You got to you sing it. No way. And so she would just go. And I would say, yeah. <laughs> and there were a couple of women in the chorus who, who were like, Man, your high C is awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it was pretty funny. That is so funny. Wow. I I feel very calm that I now realize I'm very lucky to have a high C. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, because there are sopranos with a short top. Mm -hmm. And like Renata Tibaldi did not have a great high C. Exactly. She was known. And uh, there are roles that, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of spintos don't have high C's often. And, and I'll also say to uh, mezzos who think they're going to get away with it, um, if you're going to sing the big repertoire, you need a high C. And you don't necessarily need to be able to, like, wail on it, but yeah. you need to be able to touch it. Yeah, in Verdi too, especially. Yeah. But not even... Mozart, Rossini, Handel, Handel not so much, but uh, depends on the ornament. Because, because they, 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 that wasn't a thing in the Baroque. That it wasn't a thing about singing big high notes. No, you're singing for God. You might sing it in a cadenza, but uh, yeah, you 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 need to have a decent high C. You need to be at least able to touch it, unless you're really going to sing contralto rep. With select roles there is tradition that comes along with them in terms of how it is sung um maybe cadenzas or ornaments that go along with it i wanted to know mm. like what your thoughts were on that and how how do you prepare those kinds of roles or how would you recommend people prepare those kinds of roles um i'm not a purist mm. and um and i I think, I think understanding tradition and listening to recordings, watching the great artists, this is all really important. Um, 
and and then working with people who understand the style is really really helpful so you know when i first started singing handle um i was sort of at the start of that or, or kind of caught that wave midway when handle really started taking off because when my career first started there were people who said to me oh my gosh you've got to sing handle and i said yeah that's great nobody nobody's doing it so i i can't just show up at a company and go hi i want to sing handle if you're they're never singing handle so um they started to produce a lot more handle and there, there was a real revival and so i i was you know sort of mid-career at that point i was in my mid-30s uh late 30s when that all started so I th I was I was kind of out of the loop like I really didn't have a lot of experience in that so I coached with a lot of really good people uh Nicholas McGeegan was in Germany a lot then so I coached with him a couple of times um I worked with uh, some really great conductors uh Danny Beckwith and um Jane Glover and um and I had a couple coaching was with Jean Lamont uh, when she was still alive um, in Toronto, who used to be the, the artistic director of Tafel Music. Um, so I would, I would go and work with people who really knew that repertoire. And, and then, you know, I think I just always go from the text um, and try to understand the character uh, and if there's source material like for example when I sang Sister Helen in Dead Man Walking I read everything I could about Sister Helen uh, saw the movie a couple of times read her books um, you know really tried to to immerse myself in the character or when I was doing you know when I did uh, um, Carabino, when I did Rosina, I read the source material, I read the plays, and um, so I, I just always, I was always interested in research and, uh, and the background work, and I really enjoyed that, kind of just forming an idea in my head, and then when I come to rehearsal, I, you know, I know the character really well, and have a lot of ideas about how I want to do it. And, um, and I, I've been really lucky too, that most of the folks that I've worked with were really open-minded and, and wanted to say something new and different. Um, I, I, I really, really get irritable with people who think, as I, I said before, who think things can only be done one way or a certain way. Um, and I, I find this sometimes disappointingly a little bit with with students that they can be very linear um yeah. very in the box about uh what how an interpretation what what's allowed i hate that word loud yeah what's allowed? i agree is, is there a, are, are there uh police that are going to come and arrest you for saying that delivering that line differently like come on where are we it's ridiculous. It's art. And well, people will say, well, oh, well, you know, Hoffman, Stahl and Strauss didn't want that. I think, well, that too bad for them. They're dead. Yep. <laughs> and you know, the second, this is the thing about creation. The second you sign off on that piece of music and that libretto, and it's, it's out there in the ether, it is gone. You have birthed that baby. And it's going to go take whatever, you know, and I, I don't think we should run roughshod over stuff, you know, and, and, and sometimes people really take things to extremes. But I'm a believer in tradition, but only to a, a, a certain point, not that, you know, what's allowed, what's not allowed, um, you know, maybe within the boundaries of taste. I don't know. I, I think that's just it's such a. It's such a fine line and I just think art has so much potential to be exciting and provocative and I just love it if I go to the theater and I see something that I'm not expecting. I don't want somebody to just dish up the same old traviata I've seen 25 times. Why? 
I don't want that again. It's like, okay, I know like when you're little and you, you saw whatever movie, the Aristocats or something like, yeah, I want to see that 3 billion times. I want to see it again and again and again. And I want it to be the same every time. I, I honestly, there's certain things that I, I, and sometimes I feel like, oh, I saw that. I saw the most definitive production. I never want to see it again. Right. But I really, think it's very interesting. You mentioned that I felt that way when, um, when we were staging dialogue of the Carmelites, I was really worried, not wor worried is not the right word. I, I wanted to do something that would be meaningful, especially in the situation that we were in at the time, you know, COVID was just starting to settle down. <laughs> um, and I think it was just interesting that working with Paul and, and you guys and, and the whole team, we were able to create something that was totally different than what I've seen and what I did when I did research of what dialogue had been done before. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that, I, I think otherwise we don't need to do it again and again. Exactly. Well, we're already doing the same operas over and over again for centuries. So let's tell the story yeah. a little bit differently each time, you know? Well, and what, what can we pull out of the story that illuminates it in a different way or, or expresses, I'm sure we're going to see all kinds of pandemic themed operas. Yes, for sure. You're going to have lots of Traviatas dying of COVID. Mimi's <laughs> dying of COVID. Um, and, yeah. you know, I think that, I think that's interesting because we also have a need to work through societal things through art uh we we work through our traumas and uh and we might find some solutions you know i think it's uh it's really interesting the work that we do there's so much potential there why would i just want to wear it in the same dress and why would i want to see carmen you know swinging her hips and wearing big hoop earrings and being a caricature of a, a gypsy woman it's stupid well kim i want to our last question and then we'll do our rapid fire of course, of course. Um, we always like to ask what is your why why do you wake up and do what you do why do you keep singing teaching performing what is your why right now My why is that art and music and singing in particular have deep meaning. And I think you, you know, you had asked me my, the question about the blog and why I wrote the blog. I think it, it, it's the same. It's that the singing, the teaching, the music making is so full of life and identity and connection. It's all interconnected, like the, the interconnection of all things is there. And I just find it's so profound every day. Like it, it, there's so many moments in my daily life where I could just cry from the beauty of it um, and from the from the the way that my students expose themselves in 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 their with their whole hearts their whole beings and how um, we can I, I feel like we can conquer anything we can we can achieve anything if we're able to go that deep and I just love, I love seeing that. I love being part of that. I love facilitating it. I love doing it. I love being around it. Um, it's just a tremendous gift. Here, here. Period, yeah. <laughs> How did I forget that part? <gasps> Ooh. That's a beautiful mug. Is this handmade? Yes. I bought it on Salt Spring Island, where my daughter lives. Wow. Yes. So cool. 
Well, unfortunately, you don't have any questions in yours, so we'll have to do the asking, but feel free to take a sip. <laughs> take a sip of air. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thumbnail right there. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, Hannah, would you like to begin? I do. I do. Okay. We're a dog mom. I'm not a dog mom, but honorary dog mom. <laughs> okay. Okay. The honor receipt. It's very classy. Um, okay, Kim, what's your favorite book? Right now, it is, uh, ah, This is the Voice by John Colapinto. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Um, guilty pleasure or bad habit you'll never break? Chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, describe yourself in three words. Impulsive, joyful, loud. Heck yeah. Good things to be as an opera singer. Um, who do you fan person over? Oh gosh. Who do I fan person over? I thought of this just the other day. I thought, oh my gosh. Brene Brown. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm a bit of a celebrity hound anyway, but she's, <laughs> I, I, I would totally, if she was standing here at the door, I would faint. Wow. Well, I'll uh, call her up. <laughs> make it happen. Okay, this is an important one to Simi and I. We've been, we've been on this journey. How, um, how do you take your bagel? What is, what is your favorite bagel top and toppings? Smoked salmon. Yep. Cream cheese black pepper, lemon. What is your party trick? My party trick. And it's not singing, singing, it doesn't count. No, no, no. <laughs> party trick. Hmm. Well, I used to be able to, to do the splits, but not anymore. Cool. Party trick. Mm. And once I put a whole potato in my mouth, but that was <laughs> that's a, a party trick. It was a really bad idea because I strained my jaw and it hurt for months after. Oh. oh gosh, party trick! How am I so unprepared for this question? <laughs> I feel like the potato was a pretty good answer. I think oh, it was too. The splits too. Terrible. That was a terrible, terrible idea. Never. <laughs> Did I have quite a big mouth? And I was showing off and I put a whole, like a quite a large potato in my mouth. And then A, I couldn't get it back out. Yes. I okay, was just stuck. Better yeah, start biting better it. a potato than a light bulb. There have been people who have tried to fit light Ooh. bulbs in their mouth too. Yeah. Not yeah, good. that's not good. No. Okay. What advice would you give to your younger self? Don't make everything so hard. What composer would you like to speak to from any era? Hmm. I think Mozart. Mm. Agreed. Yeah, I'm sure he, he was probably totally irritating, but I think it's probably pretty, sure. funny. It's pretty funny. And probably like just like super toilet humor and um, it's like a 15 year old boy through and through oh my gosh or eight year old boy but but um i think he would probably have been also just a fascinating human i agree wholeheartedly um uh, i can't even read my own handwriting what's the most recent thing you learned Mm. Don't put a potato in your mouth. That's what I learned. Yeah, that's, that's, that, yeah, don't. Uh, most recent thing I learned that breathing through your mouth is not good and that we should all breathe more through our nose. 
The last one is, uh, what is your favorite swear word in any language? Obviously, fuck is the best word. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbeatable. Like, even, you know, I, 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 in German, there's no good swear word. It's like scheiße is everything. Yeah, there really isn't a good one. Like, there's no good swear word. Um, and, uh, no, it's, it, even other languages use it. And then the way Ricky Gervais says cunt is also very, very funny. Okay. I am so glad you said that because that's my favorite swear word, but I'm always scared to say it publicly because people don't always get married. And you can add, you can add fuck to it. So, oh, you fucking cunt. (laughs) I love that. Delivery was prime. Very, very Oh yeah. It's so good. Ricky Gervais. Best. (laughs) Um, Kim, can you please tell the people where they can find you? Where they can find me? Uh, They can find me uh, on my website at KimberlyBarber.com. They can find me on Instagram at Sing sing and Self. They can find me on Twitter at This Land Canada. And they can also find me on the Laurier website or on LinkedIn. I'm very easy to find. Google me. (laughs) All of the links will be down in the description box. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure speaking with you and getting to know you better and hearing all your knowledge and things. We have so many other topics to talk about for the future. Absolutely, yes. Thank you so much. You know, when you're like, oh, I'm going to see you like any minute and it just won't come. I can't believe I haven't had to do it yet. (laughs) (laughs) Just as you're talking about Wendy Nielsen, I was like, "Ah!" I did catch that. Sorry, Wendy. I love you.